Let's all stand together this morning and we're going to sing song number 34. He is Lord. We're singing it twice through. Song 34. Good morning. Glad that you are here today. This is my favorite time of the year. I don't know where everybody else lies on what season, but I love the fall. I love the windows open at night, and I love the heat during the day. It's a beautiful day again today and the next couple days, but we're glad that you're here today. You don't come to church on accident. You have to choose to come. You have to plan to come, unless your parents tell you you'll be here, but other than that, you've got a plan. All right, let's pray together. Father, thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, what a day it is. This is the day the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you that every day is yours. We're so thankful for Sunday, the first day of the week, set aside specially for us to collectively worship together, to come into union again together, to pour into one another's lives, to, to, to be refreshed uh, from, uh, from the week as we prepare for the new week. And we're thankful for that. Thank you for the turning of the calendar. And now that we are in the first day of October, we pray as we, we race towards the end of the year that we will not miss anything that you have for us. Help us not to, to race so ahead of you that we miss maybe somebody or something that you're doing and stirring in our hearts. Help us to be very conscious of that. Thank you that you are who you say you are and thank you that we can come together in unity and we know that unity only comes from you. Help us to keep those distractions in our life away from us, that we may continually have our hearts and minds on you. And one day, maybe today, maybe soon, maybe 100 years from now, we don't know. But Father, we're going to be in your very presence forever. Father, thank you for that. What a blessing that is and what an encouragement it is for each and every one of us. Thank you now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So today's um, first day of the month, and so we have the Lord's table. You might be preparing your heart now for that time. And then also we have new verses. So we have two new verses, and I hope you're doing well on your Bible memory. Uh, remember, if you struggle with memorization, uh, that's okay. Some, some do, some. It's amazing. You look at it, and it seems like it just drops into place. Uh, you can write these down on three by five cards, and just during the day when you have some free time, just just go through them and just get them familiar in your mind. You might not be able to commit them word to word, but you can commit the general principle, the general thought that God is giving us um, in the scriptures. You ready? Okay. Psalm. Are you guys sure you're ready? I mean, I'm right. Well, we don't have to do the wave, but how about let's do a real quick, woo, you know, type of thing. There we go. Perfect. Now let's do it. Psalm 139, 17 and 18. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. It sh should count them. They are more in number than the sands. When I awake, I am still with thee. Psalms 139, 17 and 18. Now the younger ones picked up on that right away and said, Listen, that's math. I do not want to learn any more math, <laughs> but that's good math. Well, I don't know um, if you ever served in children's ministry, but one of the things you do is um, when, when you're memorizing verses, you always say, are you ready? And then they say, yeah, and then, and then, and then they go through the verses. So, so maybe next week we'll, we'll give a big yeah, you know, that would be great. Um, well, uh, we'll sing song number 17 in the celebration hymnal our great savior and one of the things we always do with any song we sing it's not just a song to sing and get through it's a a song to worship the lord and, and the chorus hallelujah what a savior 
Think about these words and our Savior. Let's stand together as we sing 17, our great Savior. singing song number 630, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Aren't you thankful for the friendship of our Savior? Song 630, What a Friend. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to you carry 
everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. Oh, because we do not carry everything to God in Let's take our Bibles, if you would, and turn with me to Revelation chapter 6. We'll be reading Revelation 6 this morning for the new sign-up sheet. So if any of you are interested in, in reading men uh, on Sunday mornings, um, you know, we'd love to have you do that. It's a great ministry. Um, we're going to be in Revelation 6 today. Beginning in verse 1, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. And when he had opened the third seal, and I, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell in the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. 
and the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountain of the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? Thank you for reading that with us this morning. We're going to sing um, the hymn of the month we sang for in April, um, Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me. And the emphasis of the song service this morning has just been the Lord worshiping Him, His friendship to us, and how blessed we are for all He's done for us. Let's stand this morning, and we're going to sing, Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. How strange and divine I can sing All is mine, yet not I But through Christ in me The night is dark But I am not forsaken For by my side The Savior, He will stay I labor on In weakness and rejoicing For in my need his power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley he will lead. All oh, the night has been won, and I shall overcome, yet not I, but through Christ in me. No fate I dread, I know I am the future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus fled and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold, my sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. Oh, the chains are released. I can sing, I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day, I know he will renew me, until I stand with joy before the throne. Harmony and I um, wanted to sing um, a special um, uh, Just As I Am, I Come Broken. Um, um, I remember when I was younger hearing um, uh, Come As You Are, Leave As You Were, and, and always being cautioned against that. But um, one of the things about, about our Lord is that we come um, genuine as we are. We don't have to, to dress ourselves up, pretend like we're something we're not. We could come to him as we are. So I hope this song is a blessing to you. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to to read. 
come wounded to be healed. I come desperate to be rescued. I come empty to be filled. I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb. And I'm welcomed with open arms. Praise God, just as I am. Just as I am, I would be lost. But mercy and grace my freedom brought, and now to glory in your cross, O Lamb of God, I come, I come, I come broken to be mended, I come wounded. I come empty to be filled, I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb, and I'm welcomed with open arms, praise God, just as I am. I come broken to be mended, I come wounded to be healed, I come desperate to be rescued. I come empty to be filled. I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb. And I'm welcomed with open arms. Praise God, just as I am. Praise God, just as I am. Amen. Wow. Amen. Amen. Oh, my. That was tremendous. That ought to change your heart a little bit. That is great. Um, those uh, for James, you can make your way back with Mr. James or across. Wow, those were powerful words. Boy. What a bummer it is to come and just be stirred and not changed. Well, that was impactful. I didn't expect that. That was beautiful. Um, just uh, real quick, um, uh, I was just thinking as I exchanged books with Mary, I was reading a book on, Mo, on uh, Abraham, and she was reading one on David by the same author, and I said, oh, boy, I've really enjoyed that book on Abraham. I've, I've learned so much. So many good principles about this man's life. And she said, oh my, I've read David um, two or three times. And I said, well, let's exchange books. And so we did today. And um, I have a four-hour flight tonight and a four-hour flight on Wednesday. And that will be just enough probably to get through this. And um, I'm telling you that to encourage you that we have a library back here. And I know that we don't go into it too often, but there are some really good literature and books in there to stir your heart about who Christ is. And so I encourage you, maybe even today, to go back there into the library and take a look at a book. And um, Marissa has done such a great job of uh, categorizing all the books uh, to where they belong. And so all you need to do is go in, and it's a self-checkout. And all you got to do is check it out, and then if you don't bring it back in a month, we'll be at your door. But if you do, then you can re-check it out as well. And then also, um, Pam... Uh, made a suggestion to the church here that maybe we could get a calendar besides just the bulletin and, and the weekly update, maybe something we could just throw on the front of our refrigerator. And so uh, we put together an October calendar, and it's, it's on the back here. Um, Harmony did the template for it. And so if someone's interested in keeping that up month to month, we could give you all the information that needs to go on there, and you could, you could uh, get that ready, you know, about two or three weeks ahead of time, and then we can um, have it ready for printout. Now, this was our first time printing it out, and it looked really nice on the PDF. And then when I printed it, guess what? The squares didn't show up. So it's a calendar without squares. But um, I think the, it was too light of a gray, and it just didn't pick up, but I already had printed it. 
And so take this one with you and then we'll make those adjustments, um, make it into a paper airplane, and we'll make the adjustments uh, later. Uh, take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to the book of Genesis. Um, we had talked about only going through verse, uh, I mean, chapter 11, and we're, we're in chapter 11, and we realize that in the, the book of Genesis, everything is new. Everything is new. And Moses gets a front row seat as through the Holy Spirit, God tells him everything that happened when nobody was there. And then he begins to also teach us as we go through the life of the table of nations, how God is working worldwide. And then when we get out of chapter number 11, it starts to focus down on one family, who the promise would come through, would come through these patriarchs. And so we're going we're gonna to see embedded in certainly the genealogies that we, read, we didn't read last week, but were in the scriptures, are embedded in there is Abraham, his family, and then eventually, of course, we'll go all the way down to the promised seed, uh, Jesus Christ, who would be born as promised to Micah, as uh, as promised in Micah five two. So what I'm telling you here is that what we'll do is because I just read that biography on Abraham was very stirred in my heart with that. Learned a lot from it. I think we'll go ahead and cut into just a little bit of twelve and just take a look at how God is then shifting one through eleven. Remember, we've been saying over and over and over again, this is everything that's new. These, these are things that, that are before the law and they transcend time to be relevant to us today as well. We'll take a look at how God will shift now, uh, starting next week, from the table of nations, worldwide view of what God is doing, the worldwide flood, worldwide creation, worldwide of God filling and, 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 and his promises and what he wants the nations to do. And now we're at the point where they're going to be scattered and there's going to be three arms, which we studied last week. There's uh, the three boys and through those three boys we have the nations of the world and then God, like a funnel, was going to bring it down where we're really going to concentrate on this nation called Israel and the patriarchs that will come down through that and how God keeps alive that promise of the seed. And we'll take a little bit about Abraham. I think that will help us to kind of pull it all together as we go. But we're not there yet. We're still in chapter number 11 of the scripture. So if you want to uh, turn your Bibles there, Genesis chapter number 11. And we're going to read the first nine verses. And we're going to talk about um, the scattering and why God scatters the nations. What, what is taking place and the rebellion that we see not only then but the similarities to the rebellion that we see in chapter 11 are the same today. It's just repackaged sin. It's different players, different names, different powers, different nations, but the bottom line is it's still the same. A total rejection of God. A total rejection of God and His plan. So let's start here in um, Genesis chapter 11, starting in verse number 1. And the whole earth... Let me get rid of this because this is in my way. Here we go. Uh, chapter 11, verse number 1. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. Isn't it amazing how we're racing to try to get back to there? And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. And that is modern day Babylon. That is modern day Iraq today. And they said one to another, go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a nation, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So in other words, they knew that the scattering was God's plan. It was God's plan was for, for, the, for those three uh, nations, to, uh, those three young men to go out there, was to multiply and fill the whole earth. The whole earth. But they're all together and they're, they're, they're comfortable and, uh, at this time. Uh, we'll develop this as we go. Um. Let's see, where did I leave off? Uh, verse 5. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, and the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men built. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound the language, and they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence and, uh, upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of the earth. Father, thank you now. Thank you for the scriptures. Uh, they are wonderful. That's why we're here. And so many times I hear from people that are here, they love to study their Bible. They love to read their Bible. They love to, to listen uh, to the scriptures every day. And so, Father, thank you that we can. And thank you that most of our homes, if not all of our homes, have scores of Bibles. We have so much of the Word of God. And yet so many countries would just love to have one book of the Bible or one page of the Bible or something to hold on to. And yet here in America, we're so blessed with so much when it comes to spirituality. We got books. We got books upon books. We have um, uh, podcasts. We have um, all types of ways of feeding ourselves so that we can grow into maturity. Help us not to neglect these resources that you have provided through gifted people that we can learn more about you. And so today as we settle our hearts down on this nice sunny day, as we, we come here to get our week started off, to readjust as you would at a chiropractor, to kind of get things back in line from a week of walking through the muck and mire of this world. And so, Father, refresh us. Remove what needs to be removed and help us to add what needs to be added. And, Father, thank you for your goodness and your grace. It is mere grace that we're even here today. Mere grace. And so we're thankful for it. And Father, what really thrills us is that we know that you have a plan for each and every one of us. No matter what season of life you find yourself in, you, Lord, have a plan for us all the way to the end. And Father, that's encouraging. That's exciting to know that, 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 that you are part of our lives. Thank you for that. Now bless and encourage us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So as we look at our text today, it's important for us to understand in every generation... Every generation, the unregenerated soul seeks to throw off God. We see that. Every generation. Those that are not born again are blind in their trespasses and sin, and, and, and they have no way of knowing the beginning from the end. They are lost, and so they seek to throw off this whole concept of a God. In fact, they throw off the one true God, but yet they form a God in their own mind to meet their own needs whether it be the God of money, the God of drugs, the God of happiness, whatever it might be, they seek to live apart from God. They want all restraints to be set free. Don't, don't put this on me. Don't, don't bind me. Don't handcuff me. Allow me to be what I want to be. Don't we see that today? We see a nation running to and fro, so quickly to try to figure out all the circumstances of life that are transparent, I mean transpiring, and so they make ridiculous comments and ridiculous laws and ridiculous uh, answers to what we're all facing to try to say, hey, don't worry, we have the answer. The answer is only found in God. The, the answer is only found in the scriptures. You cannot find them anywhere else. They are lost in their trespasses and sins, and unless they come to Christ, I was at the Bible study yesterday, but I understand that at that Bible study at Dale's house was a lot talked about evangelism. Unless we get off these pews and we get out into the community and share our faith, they'll stay the same way. They'll stay the same way. Now, turn your Bibles, if you would, to Psalms chapter number 2. And let's take a look at what is transpiring in the unregenerated heart. There's a beautiful picture here in Psalms. 
chapter number 2, verses 1 through 5. 1 through 5. Are you there? The scriptures say, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? That word vain is what? Empty, fruitless, ridiculous, unbelievable. They imagine a vain thing. They have built together a system that says, this is the way we got to go, but the end thereof is death and destruction and separation from God. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heaven, His response, God's response, is he that sitteth in heaven shall what? Laugh. Really? I made you. I created you. I gave you all that you needed to have complete joy and fulfillment that you're so looking for. And yet you're running to and fro and you're following a fallen master. And he he just, he laughs. The Lord shall have them in what? Derision. They shall, then shall he speak unto them in his wrath. And vex them in his sore displeasure. The account today shows the confusion of tongues um, uh, to be the outgrowth of human boldness and disobedience. The practical lesson of the narrative must be primarily this. That the present resulting confusion that is upon us in our text must serve as a constant reminder of the inclination of the human heart to arrogance and disobedience. That's what it is. That's what we see in the leadership. Just an arrogance and a disobedience uh, to, 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 to lead in darkness. The multiplicity of languages upon the face of the earth is, is a monument not to human ingenuity, but to human sin was its cost was its cause, rather. So today, as we try to piece back this chapter that maybe we would read and say, okay, great, what's in it for me? I believe we can glean some things out about tower building. Tower building. And so there's just two points. And the first one is go up in sin, going up in sin. And the second one is God coming down in judgment, like a yo-yo, up and down. So our first point is going up in sin. In verses 1 through 4 that we just read, so we're going to separate our our verses. We have nine verses. 1 through 4 is going to be the first point, and 5 through 9 will uh, cap out our second point. So in verses 1 through 4, we see mankind progressing and building up in sin, building his tower that represents their man-made God seeking to uh, usurp God, seeking to remove God from their life. So here in the plains of Mesopotamia, which means two rivers, that's, that's, that's what that word means if you look at it, it's two rivers, and that's Euphrates and Tigris, and that land was very fertile, and so as they began to move out and away from the ark, and these families began to multiply, they're all of one thought, they're all of one mind, they have, many already have departed, from faith, and they're living, uh, they're living to usurp God, seeking to remove God from their life. So the first thing we want to look at is the impressive achievements of Babylon. Uh, Babylon represents a massive technical uh, technology. Uh, techn- I'm sorry. I yeah. Thank you. Advance. The people live in an organized city. Uh, they're, they're starting to come together. Uh, man's mind is open. He's able to create. Aren't you glad he is? I enjoy driving 55 miles an hour, not having to walk somewhere. Or, or you think of the road up, 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 in, up 94. It's called Half Day Road because you take a half a day to go from there to the city on a horseback. And so I'm glad that we don't have to do that. We're able to get in a car and go. I, I love the advancements that we do have. So the people are an organized city. We are told they use brick instead of stone. They use slime or tar or you could say asphalt. They are living in a flat, fertile plain formed by flood deposits using the material found for building materials. But 
they took this clayish material and they were able to construct buildings and towers. And that's a wonderful thing. I'm glad they, they could do that. I'm glad for the modern home, aren't you? I'm glad for the conveniences we have even today. Aren't you glad to have a chair instead of a bench or an old wooden bench or a, a dirt floor? These, these are nice things. So they could make bricks of any shape or any size and able to construct buildings of any shape in vast numbers, um, able to construct great buildings and sophisticated buildings in great numbers. So technology is moving. Uh, we see that today. Well, it seems like it only takes about a year and it's obsolete. You get an iPhone 48 or whatever number they're on and I, iPhone 50s on the production line. That's how fast you're out of touch. But instead of using these wonderful advancements for the good, uh, for good and for um, a godly pursuit, they use them for evil. Here they did. They, they, God's opened up their mind. They're able to put their minds together. People are able to think. Um, they're able to borrow brains from one another, and they're able to figure out we can take the slime and we don't have to use stones anymore that never stay together, and you can only go so high. We can actually burn these bricks, and we can take this, and we can build big buildings, and we, we can have so much more. But instead of using that for the furtherance of, 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 of the gospel or the furtherance of godly living, they were, they were using them to build a tower to usurp God's will, to sway people to rebel against God, to carry out their life without God. Here's what they're doing. Look at this. Genesis chapter 9, verse number 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. That's what God told them to do when they got out of the ark. Listen, I want you to go. I want you to be fruitful. I want you to replenish the earth. That was God's command. That's what they should have been working on. But instead of that... In Genesis 11:4, this is what they did. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. Now, you remember last week we talked about that, that being that language we find out of Isaiah, where, where, where Satan says, Lucifer says, I will, I will be like the Most High. That's what they're saying here. That's the language. They're saying the language is right here is, let's throw off God, whose, whose top may reach unto the heavens. They're not saying that it'll actually go up into the heavens. That's impossible. We know that. What they're saying is that we'll be like the Most High. So they want to build this tower and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. They didn't want God's plan. God's plan was he was going to scatter. God's plan was he was going to have these nations. God's plan was through the, the tents of Shem, the gospel would get out to all nations and that there would be order. But they did not want this. We're like that sometimes too. We say, how can they do that? Who would do that? I mean, come on. Look at look what they did in the Old Testament. But don't we do that? We don't like sometimes what God says. And so we actually build a tower and start building a tower to do what we want to do. We need to be careful and discerning in how we use the great advancements of our day. Unfortunately, many of the te technical advancements today are leading many believers back into enslaving sin. So instead of using them to propagate and get the gospel out, all this fun and all this activity and all these things and all this technology is actually being used to build towers in our life to pull us back into enslaving sin. We need to be careful about that. Access to the internet has, great, internet has great benefits. I love that. Google, what time is it? Google, what's the weather in Elgin? I mean, I, I, what's the traffic? I, I love that I can just get on there and ask that question and, um, and get the answer. But access to the internet it does have good benefits, and I, I'm glad for it. But it also gives an open access to dark and scary places. It really does. There is a highway found in Isaiah that's called the Highway to Holiness. That's a great internet. That's a great internet. But this highway right here is exactly what was taking place um, back in Genesis number 11. It was, it was taking the goodness of God and what he's allowed us to have and take us to dark and scary places. And so now the masses are being swayed as well. 
The places are causing for believers that know better. These places are causing a great dearth in faithfulness. Who can find a faithful man? Paul said in Timothy, he says, man, I need someone to take over this ministry. I need somebody to be here. I, I, I need some help. And he goes, I'm looking and I'm looking and looking and I can't find anyone that I can hand this off to. I can find nobody faithful. And so these, these, these towers that we allow back into our life that ought not to be there, these towers like they were building to throw God off and to say, God, who are you? Not your will, but my will. Uh, and we need to knock those towers down. Don't let them get build up in your life. Don't let them become habits that are pulling us away from completing the mission of making and maturing disciples. We can't have these towers in our life. What towers do you have in your life that you're building? You're putting pitch and mortar together and you're building it so you can be like the Most High. You would never say that. But let the Holy Spirit touch your heart right now with what towers you are building. Maybe it's pride. Maybe it's bitterness. Maybe it's secret sin. Maybe it's just a, 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 an unfaithful spirit. I, I don't know what it is. But don't let those towers get built. See, there's a great dearth in faithfulness. There's a great dearth in evangelism. There's a great dearth in discipleship, in growing in Christ, and in separation from the world. Sometimes it's really hard to see the demarcation, the difference between the world and the church today. There ought to be such a clear marking of the difference between the world and the church. The philosophy of the world is consuming many believers it's consuming our time and our energy. What are we doing with all of our time? You know, much, you know how many minutes you get a day? 1,440. That's a lot. That's a lot of minutes. You're responsible for them. Now you're going to have to sleep some of them. Not all of them. You're going to have to sleep some of them. And you're going to have to get up and be busy. Idle time is one of the greatest sins. It's not the mother of all sins, but it is a great sin to waste time. Time is a great commodity for us here on earth. God has given us time. What are you doing with it? The philosophy of the world is consuming many believers. The, the, and energy on things that are futile, things that are vanity, things that make no sense at all. And it's causing a great apathy in the church and carrying out of God's will. Secondly, but over against this remarkable achievement, there's a very dark side. Babylon, Babel, Babylon, not only has great achievements, but it also has a selfish, arrogant spirit. That's what tower building does. It changes you from the humbleness we should have as believers to a selfish and an arrogant spirit. And for those that are unsaved, it emboldens them to throw off God and say the, that there is no God and to live in disbelief they appear very self-confident i see that with the politicians don't they seem so self-confident they spew out all this stuff as though it is gospel and it's so far from the truth and 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 they're muddled around trying to trying to trying to figure out how to run everything when it's right here in the scriptures they're confident they're going to shape their own destiny they were selfish. They were going to control their future by collective effort apart from God. That's what was taking place in chapter number 11 under Nimrod. They were getting together and they were saying, listen, we're going to throw off these restraints. We're going to get these cords off of us and we're going to be like the Most High. We're going to live the way we want to. God wants to scatter. We don't. We want to have one language and we want to stay together. Don't break our unity up. Don't break our unity up. We got something going here. I mean, we're, man, we got bricks. Okay? I mean, we don't have stones. We got bricks. We have three or four different fashions now. It's not just the drape. We have belts. We have, you know, and we don't want what you want, God. That's old-fashioned. Man, let us go. You're holding us back. Is that the lie of the devil? It's been then, it's been there, it's, it's the same today. Don't tower build. God has built a godly highway. 
Stay on the highway of holiness. No animal, nothing can attack a person who's on the highway of holiness, the scriptures say. But they were selfish. The tragedy is their only concern was about themselves. Tower building is always about yourself. That's why plastic surgeons do so well. Because it's always about themselves. There's a bold and selfish selfishness that plays in these words. Listen to what they said. Let us make us. Do you see the terminology there? Those two us's. Let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad from the face of the whole earth. In other words, you know what? If God comes in here and, and rains on our parade, if God comes in here and we have to do his will, man, the fashions are gone. The makeup is gone. The, 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 the self-esteem is gone, and we're going to have to do it his way. We don't want that. Let's throw that off. Our nation's like that now. They want nothing to do with God. If we want to kill people, we'll kill people. If we want to kill babies, we'll kill babies. It's for the better good. But he, he says here, let us make us a name, lest we be scattered. Now, and let us make us a name. This is the language of pride in mankind. It is the unregenerated heart who wishes to know nothing above himself. And to rise up beyond the reach of an overruling providence. That's all it is. It's shaking your hand and your fist in the very face of God and saying, I know more than you do. I can run my life more better than you can. Tower building language should be a foreign language to us as believers. We ought to know nothing of the language of the world. It ought to be a shock to hear some of the things we hear and the people that we idolize that should not be idolized. Keep it a foreign language. Don't know it. Don't know its verbs and its tenses. God is on the throne. We ought to be steadfast on his word and carrying out his will. That's his plan. See, tower building always ends up in destruction because everything that rises by human effort falls. Oh, it might not seem like it's not going to. It might seem like, oh, this is going to be free. No, God said everything will be broken down and scattered. In fact, everything's going to burn up. Let's not put too much money into the building. It's all going to burn anyways. Everything's going to go. Everything you have is gone, burned, gone, finished, except for faith. See, they're not concerned about God's will. It's about we and our and our comfort. They want to live for themselves. There is strength in unity, but this unity was not God-fearing. It was a unity built on sin, a unity based on unbelief. That is what we have going on here. It's, it, it's built on unbelief. It's, it, it's built on selfishness. It's built on outside of God's these and thous. Now let's take a little trip here and think about over the last decades here. If you've been alive that long, some of you have been says, um, how about the Babylon spirit has been in decades laid behind us, the decades in which have lived, been marked by special uh, decrees of self-centered faith in human technology and hu uh, human ingenuity, political and every kind of government ranging from capitalism to communism have promised a man-made heaven on earth. That's what they've said. Follow us. We, got, we know what's best for you. Follow us, follow us. And we've seen this, this tower building, this Babylonian spirit. Through all these failures, we still have not repented and turned to God, but we have increasingly removed God more and more. We seem to be intoxicated with our own abilities and our cleverness. Where's it gotten us? Are we the better today without God? Are we better today by kicking God out of our nation? Are we better today by removing prayer in school? Are we better today by, by treating God as a spare tire, only grabbing onto him when our needs are greater than our fear? I mean, wh where, where, where's the victory in that? There is no victory in that. That's tower building. It always leaves you empty. 
See, these people did not want to follow God's will. They wanted to stick together and build a tower so they would not be scattered all over the face of the world. Their comfort was more important than God's will. They chose their own agenda over God's master blueprint. You ever look at those blueprints? They don't make any sense at all, but boy, when it's done, it's beautiful. You know, you see all these little X's and turns and all this, but when God's done and you allow him to have your life and your decision-making, I want to tell you something. There is no greater joy than following God's way. God's way is always the right way. And he has a plan for you. The goal was not to be like God, but to replace God. That's what, that, that, that was their goal. They don't intend to serve God, but they wanted God to serve their will. We are like them many times. We... Our, 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 we are way over his way. We don't follow his will for us today. We follow it partially. We're not all in, but God wants us to be all in. Everything. God, here's my life. Isn't that what dedication is all about? Dedication is, God, here's my eyes. You take them. Would, I, don't let them go anywhere you wouldn't want my eyes to go. God, here's my hands. I don't want to let my body in, in Romans 6 be used for unrighteousness anymore. I want it to be used for righteousness. Here's my hands. Lord, here's my feet. Don't allow them to go anywhere they should go. Father, here's my mind. You control it. You take it where it needs to go. Keep that garbage and that harm out of my life. Don't allow me to be like the heathen and build towers that scream, no God. There's certain things you can look at right away and you say, oh my goodness, is that not evil? Have you just sensed that sometimes? You'll see something, you say, oh my goodness, that is so evil, that's so anti-God. And that's the way they were. And sometimes we as Christians follow along just far enough back so we don't look as bad as they do. But as they move further into depravity, we move a little farther into depravity. But it looks a little bit better than their depravity, so it must be okay. They wanted their own agenda. They didn't intend to serve God. We follow partially, but we need to be all in. Are, are you and I striving to follow his word, or do we direct our life according to the passion of our own heart? That's a dangerous position to be in. Does Babylon's spirit woo us away from God to serve ourselves? That constant call that says, hey, 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 come on, come on, it's okay here, the water's fine, you're going to be okay, your parents are out of touch, it's more important for you to be popular, it's more important for you to be well-liked, it's more important for you to do what you want to do, you have time to live for God later. What Tower of Babel are you building or partaking in? Some of these towers are already built, so we don't have to build them, but we're partaking in them. We're eating our lunches there. We're eating our dinners there. We're eating our social life there. And God said this ought not to be. Tear it down. Do you remember uh, Ronald Reagan? Those of you who like Ronald Reagan, he says, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Why? Because it was oppressive. It was holding back freedom. In the same way, God says, tear down this tower. Tear it down. It's holding you back from accomplishing all I have for you. It is a false hope. It, it, it is giving you something that is full of poison and you can't see it. Cease all activities with those that partake in such activities. Hey, listen, don't cast your pearls before the swine. God's given you beautiful salvation. Don't cast it before the swine. If you want to take your Bibles and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, I'd like to just mention these verses as we close up here on our second point. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 18. You know, if you're here for Sunday school today, uh, Craig made a tremendous comment. And, man, I took out my message right away and I, I fit it in right here. So hang on, Craig. I stole it from you. Praise God. It was good. <laughs> In fact, I think Randy said to me when he came here, he says, man, I walked in late to Sunday school and the comment he said convicted me and now you're going to say it again? <laughs> Don't do that. 
2 Corinthians chapter 6, 14 says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Have nothing to do with it. For what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness? It, right? I mean, these are just so, they make so much sense. But see, if you're living in the world, it doesn't make sense. And what communion have light with darkness? And what concord have uh, Christ with Abelia or, the, or, or a satanic type of behavior? Or what part have he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement have the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in thee and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And what agreement um, at the temple of God, uh, I'm sorry, I read that. So it says in uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 17, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, save the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughter, saith the Lord Almighty. Wow, that's it. That's what God calls us to do in a day and age of tower building all around us. Stay away from it. They don't have the answer. It's toxic. It will ruin your life. Don't, don't buy in to this philosophy that Satan has built all through that eat, drink, and do whatever you want, and be merry because you only live once. That's not true. You live forever. You live somewhere forever. Every person in here today, when you die one day, you will spend in one or two places, you will either be ushered right into the very presence of the Lord. Death is nothing but a welcome mat into the presence of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. Now that's exciting. And tower building leaves you in a scattered um, area, uh, paying for your own sins, separated from God in a place called hell forever. There's no hope there. But boy, it sure seems like fun, doesn't it? Man, a tower is so attractive. It's got all the lights. It's got all the glare. It's got all the promises. All the promises are there. Just sign here. Come on in. Everyone's accepted here. Now for the big Craig moment. He said this. This is in principle form already. It's so simple. As I sat there, I said, oh my that's so simple. It says, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. <laughs> there it is. Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. If, if God hates this, stay away from it. If God loves this, run to it and embrace it. If God says, hey, listen, this is not right. This is going to damage you. This is going to hurt you. Stay away from it. Run to everything the world says is good and you'll be fine. And then last... We got this building going on. We got, we go, we've gone from stones to, to baked bricks. Uh, this, is, this, this, is, this is a wonderful thing. We're advancing God, and you want to hold us back. And so they try to kick God out, but God always scatters at certain points when it becomes too much. God's long-suffering, but he's only so long-suffering. So God comes down in judgment. Now we see verses 5 through 9. Uh, we read those earlier, but it's been a while, so let's just take a look at those. In uh, chapter number 11, starting in verse number 5, And the Lord came down to see the city. Now you realize the Lord didn't come down. He's a spirit. Uh, this is, um, are you ready for this word? I've been working on it all night. Anthropomorphic. And what that means, I'm sure I butchered that word, what that means is that God does not have a body, so sometimes you're laughing at me, EJ, because you know that word. <laughs> I call this guy and he, he sends me a text and it takes like three hours to dissect all the words. So anyways, uh, uh, what this is basically just saying is, is that God says his hand is upon you, right? Well, he has no hand. So what it's just saying is so we can understand it, so we can understand what he's trying to tell us in, in the way that we can put it all together in our minds. So God doesn't actually come down. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them. In other words, the depravity is only going to go deeper. It's not going to get better. Things don't get better with time. Sin never gets better with time, which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, that trinity, let us go down 
and there com, com, uh, confound their language that they may be that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build. They left off from building the city. So God comes down in judgment. He has not taken the trouble to rise up and do battle with them. He despises them. He knows how absurd and how irrational and how futile all their attempts against him are. I mean, right? It's just ridiculous. He therefore laughs at them. And he has, la and, and he, and he has laughed, but now he will speak. God's long-suffering. Aren't you glad? But when he speaks... He speaks. He needs not physical, physically to smite them or injure them. The breath of his lips is enough. Now when their power is at its very height, which it was, which it was, and their fury most violent, which it was, then shall his words go forth against them. And what is it that he says to them? He says this. He says, Jehovah's, Jehovah's will be done and man's will uh, frets and thunders in vain. So God says, listen, this tower is not going to go anywhere. There's no way. I have a greater plan. My plan is through the seed of a woman that you can be redeemed. It isn't being co-equal with me. It isn't tower building. The Yahweh came down is a vivid way of stating that God arrived. I'm going to be on a flight tonight. It's four hours. I'm going to be glad about 1130 tonight. It says we're one mile from touching down. So we see where God, um, till then, he did not enter into the affairs of the children of men, simply allowing, simply allowing things to take their natural course, which he did. Now he manifestly intervenes and takes the situation in his hand. His judicial control and regulation is in his coming down. I will, because I am a loving God, I love you, but I'm also a just God. And you keep rejecting that the tower is not the answer. You are, like he said to Paul, you're kicking against the bricks. You're causing me problems. God charges, this is merely the beginning of what they do. It's not going to get, it's, it's only going to get worse. Rebellion has no bounds. Did you know that? The depths of depravity will continue the building of the Tower of Babel is just the beginning. What will be next? Well, we can answer that. Look what America's done by kicking God out. Look, look what came next. It didn't, it didn't slow down there. Look at the confusion of today. What they plan to do next will not be to test. Do you see the Tower of Babel is only the beginning, so God will take away the only unity which they still possess by confounding the unity of their language, and the result will be such ungodliness as planned to take place in the future will be canceled. They had big plans. It just wasn't there. That's as far as we got. If God would have been long-suffering, we would have to add in chapter 11a, chapter 11b, chapter 11c, because they would have gone worse. But God says, I'm canceling it right here. I am going to confound their languages, and I am going to scatter them. And he did. Found their language. Now they are divided and unable to communicate. Their tower building ends in an embarrassing failure. They promised everybody. An embarrassing failure. Can I tell you that all the things and tenets of this world that cry out, live any way you want, there's no accountability, you can live, you can, you can do whatever you want, is going to be an embarrassing failure because there's separation from God apart from Him. All towers of Babel will fall. All towers. That's why I don't fret at night. I sleep quite well. I fall ready to sleep because God's in charge. I don't have to worry about the Towers of Babel. What I need to do is I need to run to the Towers of Babel and give them the gospel so that they would come to Christ and they would take those towers down and that we would see revival and we would see God change a nation, which he can. Or if not, he's going to take down all those Towers of Babel without us by his very tongue and his word. And we're going to be behind him on those horses. And that will happen one day. But until then, we are, to, we are to call out those towers and say, wait a minute, stay out of that tower. 
Stay out of that tower. Be separated from it. But we're to run to the tower and preach the gospel. First, as believers, we need to take note when we have a high hand and we choose to start to build a tower of direct disobedience as born-again believers, we're acting the same way. We're a Benedict Arnold. We're a traitor to the cross. Our sin will go further than we realize, causing great hurt to the cause of Christ, to our families, to the body of Christ. Secondly, God is in control. Don't waste your time complaining about the, the, the Babel structures. Preach against them. Tell people about them. Warn them that this is a dangerous place. But get out there. Get among. Christ was a friend of sinners. Get out there and, and, and give the gospel. Give them the hope that you have. They're all going to be scattered one day. It's all going to be naught. God's long suffering will come to an end. Our response is to invade their territory with the gospel before it's too late. All Babels, all Towers of Babel, whichever way you want to say it, will be divine, divinely scattered one day. History tells us that always the enemies of God that build towers will, will suffer divine scattering. Each empire grows up and becomes powerful and then it self-destructs through sin. We see that in America. We see a great power of, 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 of our original intent of, 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 of um, uh, of, of, of the gospel and getting the gospel out and being a sending nation so we become powerful and then it self-destructs through sin it degener degenerates and God comes and scatters the people and we're seeing that today we have that in America we can see these towers of Babel and rebellion and we know divine judgment will come and ultimately all wrongs will be righted so be on the right side and then last just as God came down in our text, he reminds us all towers will come down. So what should we be doing right now? Get urgent. Quit wasting time. You got 1,440 minutes. Don't spend any time in a foreign tower. Don't go where the language is not biblical. Don't hang out in the wrong place. Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for a message right out of the Bible that tells us that the towers of Babel, the towers of Babel, this Nimrod, this, this anti-God rhetoric, rhetoric will all be scattered one day. It, it has no future. And you proved that in chapter 11 by coming down in a sense of judicial punishment and scattering the people so that they could not accomplish their rebellion. And so, Father, in the bigger picture, we see towers of Babel everywhere. Satan is building them left and right. He is convincing our young people, convincing our old people to lighten up, to, to live the way that we want to. And, Father, please give us the boldness and the ability by grace to separate ourselves not as monks, not as uh, up in a mountain all by ourselves, but in a way that we would stay out of, the, out of the towers, but yet get the gospel out of the barn so that the seed is planted everywhere we go. May we be Johnny Apple seeds. May we just plant seeds everywhere we go. And Father, we know that the Word of God is powerful enough to save the most wretched tower builder out there. And so, Father, we do pray that we would see more salvations, that we'd see more of our maturing in Christ. And Father, if we're in any tower today, if there's a young person hanging out in the wrong tower, if there's a middle-aged person hanging out in the wrong tower, if there's an old person hanging out in the wrong tower, Father, uh, get us out of it. May we repent and get right with you and redraw the lines according to the scriptures. And so, Father, help us to be a light in a world that's very dark. And we can be, and we're glad that we can. We ask this in Christ's name, amen. So today, the challenge is simply this. If you're here today and you do not know Christ, in fact, if you were to die today, if you took your last breath and, and, and you were swept off into eternity, do you know where you'd spend eternity? Have your sins been forgiven? Have you come to Christ, God's Son, who died on the cross for us, so that we could be rescued from sin. And by his imputed righteousness, we can be perfect in your eyes. Father, that's, that's what we need.
we need a Savior. And then for the vast majority of us here, then um, what are you doing? Take an inventory right now. What towers of, 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 of Babel have you built in your life? You just, you just crossed the line. You've, you've gone farther than you should. You're, you're, you're feasting in the enemy's cafeteria. And it smells good and looks good, but it's poison. We need to pull out of that. We need to, we need to by grace, separate ourselves unto holiness and grow in our sanctification that we might be able to reach those that are building those towers instead of joining them for a season of time. So I don't know what your need is. Miss Eve is going to play. Thank you. And as she plays, you come. Maybe you need to come forward and say, I'm not sure where I'd go when I die. I just don't know, but I'd like to know. I'd really like to know where I'd spend eternity. I'm not sure. Come, come. Let us show you from the scriptures how you can know. And if you're here today and you're born again and you know you're born again and you know no matter what, you'll be with the Lord forever. What tower are you living in? Get out of the Tower of Babel. Run. Don't feast in the cafeteria of pleasure. Follow God's will. Follow it wholeheartedly. There you will find joy. There you will find fulfillment. And only there will you hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. What's your need? What's your need? Your decision. And God came down. That song that Tim and Harmony sang, those words, is exactly what we need today. Just come as you are, broken, to be fixed. If I could have Dale and Ed make their way up here for the Lord's table. If I could have Paul make his way up here too as we close. Father, thank you for your goodness, your grace, your word. Sometimes preaching can sound harsh and unloving. It can. But Lord, on the flip side, there's so much love in this message that you want to heal us and you want to fix us and you want to use us. And so Lord, we pray that would be the case, that we would see that your way is the best way. So Father, help us to make sure we're in the household of faith and then Lord, change us into the very image of your dear son. Well, these two men here, um, Ed to my left, I mean, um, Dale to my left and Ed to my right, they will pass the elements. I just want to remind us that uh, to partake in the Lord's table uh, is to be born again, that you know Jesus Christ is your Savior. You've come to faith in him alone. Your sins are forgiven, past, present, and future, and you have a home in eternity. And so this is a remembrance of the broken body and a remembrance of the blood that was shed for us. It's the New Testament covenant in Christ. That's what we're doing today. But the Bible says also, don't come to it unworthy. Search your heart. If you need to get something right, get that right. And then partake in it. And so during this time when we do pass it, I ask you to hold down your talking while the elements are being passed so those around you can get into contemplation. They can close their eyes and have some quietness to, 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 to dwell and to meditate upon the Lord uh, during that time. And and so, um, would you please, Dale, uh, pray for the bread? Thank you, Father, for today and uh, the message, your living word. And thank you for uh, uh, our righteousness. Uh, Jesus shed his blood on the cross for our sins. His body was uh, crucified uh, for the sins of mankind, for our sins. And thank you that uh, we can learn by your grace and our faith to trust. Amen. Uh, in newness, uh, in the new life, the born again life. Uh, help us to uh, 
celebrate that we have in you uh, a new life that was saved and that was sealed. We bless your name. We thank you for today. We thank you for the, the doctrine and, and the song and the singing. Amen. And just your word is alive and the exhortation to uh, holiness. The scriptures tell us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, For I have received of the Lord that which also I deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he break it and say, Take, eat, this is my body which was broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Thank you for your patience, as I know we're running late, but... This is good for us to do this and to be remembered of it. And so I'll ask Ed if you'll take time here to bring us to the throne one more time regarding the blood. Father, thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who shed his sinless blood for us. Your word in Matthew 26, 28 reads, For this is the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. We celebrate this truth as a thankful remembrance, not only today, but daily, of this eternal gift we've been given. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.
After the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as oft as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show forth the Lord's death until he comes. Tim, could you make your way up here? And appreciate Tim and Harmony today. That was a wonderful um, hymn that they sang. Come on up. And um, thankful for him. We match. They have the same suits on. I don't know how we do that, but we always tend to have the same suit on at the same time. We don't even talk about it. Um, that's right. That's what it is. Yeah. And so Tim has a few announcements that will be important um, for us as we go forward. Thank you. Thanks, man. Thank you. Um, the only announcements I have to make today uh, are regarding our work day this Saturday. Um, our, this Saturday, we are going to be here from 1 to 5. You know, if you'd like to come and help us out, clean some things. We have uh, 34 cleaning projects and, and then 34 work projects. But if you'd like to do some of the work projects, um, you might need to get with me ahead of time just so that we could work together on what that would look like and, and different things like that. Um, because some of them, as far as painting and, and things, you know, might need a little bit more prep work. So, but we're going to have um, a bunch of sheets of paper. You come at one, you can look and see what you'd like to do, and, and you and two or three other people can, can knock out one project at a time. The goal is to get all of them done, but if we don't, you know, just give us two, three hours. If you'd like to stay the whole time, all four hours, great, um, and get as much done as we can. Get it, get it nice and clean for the for the winter. Um, and then the other announcements are just that um, we have a few sign-up sheets on the back. Um, we have a ladies' activity coming up. We have a church fellowship at the end of the month, our, our chili cook-off. Um, and we have our harvest outreach, of course. So just a few sign-up sheets if you're interested in coming to those. Um, put on your radar. As Pastor mentioned, we have the calendar. So that also, we just want to have as many avenues, you know, whether it's the announcements on the screen or a calendar or the weekly update, just so that uh, we can get it into your hands and, and you can know what's going on here at Faithway. And we appreciate all of the participation. You guys really participate and we appreciate it. So thank you and you are dismissed.